So our question is for all of you textile collectors out there, what do you do, um, a question for Ann Headland, what do you do with um, a moth infestation? <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> It's a tough thing to combat. I think we have a number of conservators here. Um, I could refer you to a number of websites that have some information about the care and feeding not of the textiles and not the moths. Um, the principal way in which museums today tend to control the entry of uh, infestations into our museums is to freeze the textiles. And they generally go through a double cycle of freezing for 24 or 48 hours, and someone can yell out and correct me, and then um, thaw them and then refreeze them. This is supposed to uh, protect from the eggs, not so much the live critters. Um, it's it doesn't work. It You're shaking work. your head. Oh. Yeah, it, it, you know, you have to do it in a concerted way. Yeah. Uh, we've always, in museums, in the, the last 20, 30 years, talked about integrated pest management, which is monitoring more than anything else. And, you know, monitoring when something's on display, when it's in storage, anything new coming in, anything um, moving around. But I, I don't have an easy answer for you. There's no spray that can be done. Ruth, yeah. do you want to comment? Uh, just um, to add to that, actually, the freezing process, yes, that's what we use uh, mostly. But um, uh, vacuum cleaning the, the textile, first of all, um, then uh, freezing it uh, for up to 72 hours, actually, is what we do, um, and then uh, repeat that at least annually. So the, the, the question is on the relationship between the, the, the textile art canon in African art and the, and the art that Sylvester was talking about earlier. Um, an artist's work is increasingly being placed in just contemporary art. I mean, that's, that's the really big thing about his uh, becoming a global artist now, you know. So it's actually being reinterpreted in different ways, but it's being placed in contemporary art. Um, I mean, you raise a very interesting point with textiles, right? I, I don't study textiles, so um, I, I was actually, when I encountered this collection I'm talking about, I was studying modern Nigerian art and contemporary art. And so I left that to go work on this. There's just a lot of stuff that, that you, you, you run across that's everywhere. And so I know that there are uh, some scholars in my field who are working on textiles and they, they do very good work, but I, I don't study textiles, so I can't really speak to textiles. Uh, but there are modern and contemporary Nigerian artists who work with the textile medium, who work with fiber, and they work with cloth and you know, fashion design and other kinds of stuff. So those we, we note, but the kind of textiles you're talking about are historical textiles, and I, I don't really study those. I see a lot of it. You know, my, my, my mother has a suitcase, you know, with cloth that's really old stuff. I see, for example, that at RCA's major African exhibition that you mentioned. Yeah, I mean, there's not been, there's not been comprehensive, you know, uh, evaluation of textiles of this sort, you know. I mean, I, 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 it's, it's something that just might be good to show and all that, but I, I don't work in that area, unfortunately. New opportunities for canon formation. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Over there on the left. So uh, a two-part question for uh, Dr. Hedlund on the time marker issue, these, these different uh, industrial produced textiles in the 19th century. If there's a chronological distinction between the Saxony um, uh, uh, yarn and the raveled yarn, uh, as well as a question on um, the red yarn in first phase Navajo blankets. You've mentioned the very specific three-ply Saxony, which is always dyed with cochineal, compared with the raveled yarns, which range from pure lac, very hard worsted single yarns through many, many different kinds. I showed that big you know, chart of them, all the way to things that are aniline, uh, uh, raveled yarns that are aniline dyed. So in answer to your question, there is on the spectrum of Bayetta yarns and their retrospect, uh, respective dyes a point at which the three-ply 
cochineal dyed Saxony yarns co-occur. And very often, um, blankets that have both raveled and three-ply commercial yarns, those two will be in very, very similar color schemes, um, sometimes almost identical. Um, something when I teach textile analysis workshops that I work with people very carefully on is the identification of raveled versus commercial plied yarns in a fabric. Because as the weaver works, a bundle of raveled yarns can become slightly twisted together and look plied. Or a plied yarn, as the weaver is working, can become slightly unplied. So they look very, very similar. And you need to take many, you know, um, not take samples, but look at many, uh, sample many areas to look at in a blanket to find that. But yes, there is a point at which you can find raveled and those three-ply yarns at the same time. Does that help you? Well, I was just wondering if, if dealing with the three-ply insect dyed ones. Yes. No, Saxony does not predate Bayetta at large. Um, it does predate certain Bayetta um, yarns, postdates others. Uh, I should be very specific here. Um, we see three ply Saxony yarns predominantly in the 1850s and 60s. By the mid, well, by the late 60s, by right about Bosque Redondo, 1868, they begin shifting into three ply Germantown yarns. Uh, by 1873, we see three-ply Germantown yarns shifting into four-ply Germantown yarns with aniline dyes. So that there is a specific sequence. And I didn't want to burden you all with all my charts that I use for the workshops. <laughs> um, but indeed, there are those to, to look at. Good question. The second half was a... Uh, red yarns in Navajo first phase? Oh, my goodness. Um, mostly raveled. Yeah, I would have to look hard to find, and our database is one very easy way when it's published to query, are there three-ply commercial yarns in any first phase known red stripe blankets? That would be very quick to do, but I can't do it offhand. <laughs> Mr. Irving up there might be able to tell me. <laughs> I, 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 just as an aside, I was, I, I was struck, as I imagine Rex was as well, by the, the uh, pre-classic, classic, and late classic terminology um, for Navajo blankets, which is exactly the same terminology we use for serializing um, uh, Mesoamerican civilization. I hope the docents uh, can keep those, keep those things separate. Uh, yeah. so. I, I will inter interject just for a second that the very famous first phase chief's blanket that was on the road show, Antiques Road Show, um, is one of those with just the blue, black, and brown, except in one corner it has a tiny piece of raveled yarn just caught into the fabric. <laughs> it was not, I, I examined the piece in Detroit, and it was definitely not added later. It was not a pastiche or something that was added to give the piece more cachet. Um, it's integral to the piece, and that helps us date it. Yeah, in the center there. So the question is um, uh, uh, both a specific and a broad one uh, for, the, for the panelists who are engaged in uh, work with contemporary communities um, where there's a change in a toolkit and there's a um, uh, change in design. Uh, what's accounting for that? Where is the agency coming from? So. I'll answer quite quickly. Um, for Navajo weavers today, the agency is twofold. One is the marketplace, no question. And it ever has been. Um, it was the, they were playing to the plains trade in the early 1800s. They played to the market all the way through. Um, their techniques didn't change for the market, but the patterns did. The second agency for contemporary weavers today is an allegiance to the art world and to weavers who have attended art school, who are interested in being known as artists, and who are marketing through galleries. So there, it's a personal aesthetic. It's a a personal uh, creative uh, stroke that I see. So both economics and creativity. Some of you may remember Melissa Cody uh, was here in December as part of the De Young's Artist in Residence program. Sylvester, could you follow on that with some, some comments about the, 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 the Benin Guild today? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it's, it's precisely the same thing. The Benin Guild, uh, after, the, uh, uh, after the King of Arawa was, was overthrown by the British, uh, the guild had a, a period of about 15 years, 18 years, where things got destabilized. The, the primary patron was gone. So um, some of the guild moved to Lagos and got involved in the tourist trade, 
but when Eweka II was, uh, came back to the throne in the early 1920s, he, he had studied with the guild. So he reconstituted the guild and had them worked for quite a long period, almost a decade, to replenish the ancestral altars in the, in the palace. So a lot of work came out from there. But the, the, the break had already occurred. And the, the king's you know, monopoly on bronze casting had been breached by that point in time. So the guild was, uh, I mean, the guild was working. The, the, king, the kings used to give bronze objects as gifts to different people. But the guild now got involved in directly marketing their own bronzes. So over time, that has, you know, the, the, the economics of, you know, uh, popular markets was, was a factor. But then art school training also came into play. And certain guild families, like the modern family, um, began to import modern kings and other kinds of uh, equipment for work. You know, so there's, there's a wide range of, of te technical improvements that's, that's coming, art school training, the, the practice of guild artists who work as contemporary artists rather than mm -hmm. you know, traditional sculptors and all that. Uh, all these are uh, factors you know, in changing. And then there is, of course, constantly the market. You know, the market is always a factor uh, in all these issues. Any other comments from our from our, our panel on that? I think that is our last question. Um, maybe I uh, would, yeah. I would like to uh, add a little bit to what Anne has said. I found in, um, in Indonesia that the uh, change in uh, uh, over decades uh, or centuries um, is to a large extent also a um, and a, uh, a response to outside influences, in particular to influences from other parts of Asia, eventually also a response to, to European um, uh, uh, material coming in, whether it's um, engravings, whether it is textiles from, from engravings from Europe, whether it is textiles from India, um, ceramics or metalwork from from China, uh, and um, this I want to stress that the response to that, in my experience, is very much a creative one. That uh, this is uh, it is not a an imitation, uh, but it is a response. It sparks of uh, imagination and artistic creativity. Uh, and that is a, a very uh, important part in the in the history of um, of uh, the region where where I have worked. Excellent. Do you? Yeah. We won't get into the the, the makers of yokes in Veracruz no. today. No. <laughs> a different problem. I'll, I'll bring one in. <laughs> right. Next time. Um, uh, if you could all join me in, in giving a warm round of applause for our speakers today, I think they've just been great. And also thanks to Bianca and Gregory for helping us get organized and the, uh, and the rest of the DeYoung staff for uh, helping us put this all together. Um, uh, please keep in mind that you can go and see the exhibition on the second floor, the Vatican exhibition uh, with your M ticket. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming and uh, hopefully we'll see you here next year. Thank you again. Thank you.